is Common Ground, creating equity through public policy and community engagement. Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Vaughn. Welcome to another edition of Common Ground, Fulton County's much celebrated answer to health disparities. Now, this integrated care service delivery approach is putting all public services, health, employment, library, and the arts in one location to address all of our constituents' needs as the title on Common Ground suggests. Now, in this show, we're talking about one of the two departments that comprise Fulton County Health Services. Those departments are health and wellness and behavioral health and developmental disabilities. With me today is the Medical Director of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, Dr. Sultan Sims. Dr. Sims, welcome to Common Ground. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for having me. Yes, this is a, um, a topic that's getting uh, much more talked about in the news. But first, let's get an understanding of what we, we mean when we say behavioral health. What does that encompass? Well, when we talk about uh, behavioral health, uh, some people uh, look at it as a focus on the neck up, uh, disorders uh, of the brain, um, and we talk about emotional help, health. Um, common disorders are anxiety disorders, depression, uh, in some cases, we see people suffer with psychotic disorders. So, um, you know, and with, with, when you talk about behavioral health, not only do you talk about the conditions, you talk about the treatments that are available for those conditions. Okay. What, what among those is the most common? I would say the most common are the anxiety disorders. Um, some people are familiar with things like panic attacks, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there's a generalized anxiety disorder where some characterized by someone just having anxiety about every, you know, any and everything. And this can really, what we really focus on is how the, these disorders impact a person's life. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that just about, I mean, don't all of us have some kind of anxiety from time to time? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between just that normal level of anxiety right. and a disorder? Right. And so when, when we talk about disorders, we don't want to make everything into an illness or a disorder. So we really focus on how are these symptoms impacting this person's life and their ability to function. If a person's unable to meet obligations, go to work, go to school, pay the bills, maintain relationships, then it's a problem. And, and that's mm -hmm. when we want to kind of uh, encourage that person to get help and see what we can do so that, that they can function optimally. Well, generally, generally speaking, how uh, prevalent is mental illness in the U.S.? It's quite prevalent. Um, we have studies that show that, you know, maybe one in four uh, adults suffer wow. from some form of a mental illness. Um, so they're quite prevalent, and we really need to get the word out. Mm -hmm. And serious mental illness, how, how big of a piece of the pie is that? So um, uh, there's one study going back, uh, I believe it was about 2004 data, that suggested about 1 in 17 uh, people may have a severe mental illness. Um, and when, when we're talking about s severity, it's just how much is this impact in this person's life and their abilities to function moving forward. We commonly look at conditions like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. uh, bipolar disorder. Um, and so, and what we see a lot uh, in that population are people who have multiple psychiatric conditions. You know, one may have a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder and a major depressive disorder uh, or, or some psychotic illness. And the more comorbidities you have, uh, the more it's likely to be a severe illness and to severely impact your ability to function. Well, now, addiction is a much more common problem mm -hmm. and that also can be a mental disorder. Tell us about that. Absolutely. We, we, we consider addiction um, mental health disorders because uh, we've, we have increasing evidence to show that when a person puts drugs into their body, uh, it affects their brain and it, it, on, on a chemical level uh, it affects their brain and we see changes, we see alterations that lead to changes in their behavior. You talk about addiction, you're talking about uh, a, a certain set of behaviors, drug-seeking behaviors, that family member who maybe uh, is, has become unreliable, who's, who's maybe stealing uh, from family members mm -hmm. and friends to support their habits. So we see those drugs affect your mind in a way that affects your behavior. What's leading to the increase in addictive behaviors and addictions to drugs and even uh, uh, prescription medications? Well, um, access is always a key. 
Um, it, it's, it's always hard to say. These things are multifactorial, environment, what's going on in a person's life, um, financial means, access, uh, particularly with prescription pain medicines, uh, we've seen an, uh, an explosion really in, in addiction of those drugs because wow. they're increasingly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, people have pain. There are people who need these medicines and it can become very difficult uh, to tease out who should have them versus who shouldn't have them. And many well-meaning people with real pain go on to develop an addiction. You know, through, you know, it, it was an honest thing that just happened. They mm -hmm. were trying their best to cope with their pain. We hear about that with certain celebrities yes. Uh, yes. who, who experience that. Yes. Um, now let's talk about the second component of your department, which is developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, what kind of illnesses we're talking about when we talk about the developmentally disabled. Well, we're talking when, when you hear the term developmentally disabled. Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong uh, during the stages of development. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there, like I said, there are many things that can go wrong. It's hard to say what exactly went wrong, but the, the end result is someone may have uh, physical disabilities, they may have cognitive disabilities, uh, disabilities in their ability to uh, reason, think clearly, process information. Uh, we have uh, clients with a lower IQ, which makes it difficult for them to learn something, certain things and to retain information. Uh, so we really work towards, uh, you know, dealing with that, dealing with those deficits. Well, as you were pointing out, I heard one of our famous media doctors say recently that no one thinks twice about seeking treatment when you have an ache or pain below the neck. But when it's above the neck, people don't want to do it. Why is that? Absolutely. And, you know, these are issues that go back, you know, a long time. Stigma is what we're really talking about here. Uh, unfortunately, many people see um, mental illness as a sign of weakness. Uh, there's shame related to going and seeing the psychiatrist. Um, and, and, and there's just that not, uh, the, the, there's uh, people are looked upon differently uh, as opposed to if they break their arm or break their leg. There's something you can see. Um, but people can't really see when something's going on uh, in a person's mind. And so what they tend to do is because of the shame, they retreat, they hide. Uh, rather than get help, they try to avoid people, and things tend to just get worse. So we really need to get the word out. Um, these things can happen to anybody. It's not a sign of weakness. It's not necessarily anything that you've done. Um, help is available, and, and, you know, let's go on and get that help and get better. Okay. Thanks so much. We will be back with Dr. Sims in just a moment. Welcome back to Common Ground. Our guest is Dr. Sultan Sims, Medical Director of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities in Fulton County Health Services. Uh, Dr. Sims, uh, just before the break you were talking about we've got to get folks help and we've got to get them treatment mm -hmm. and so we're in Fulton County and we want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the services available for behavioral health treatment in Fulton County. Okay, so we have a variety of services available. We have adult behavioral health services. We offer diagnostic assessments, um, referrals to appropriate. Uh, we, we can't do it all in Fulton County. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those things that we're not able, those needs we're not able to meet, we'll refer people to the appropriate place. Um, in addition to diagnostic assessments, we provide medication management, individual counseling, group counseling. Um, we do have uh, substance abuse groups uh, that we offer. Uh, we have a child and adolescent psychiatry program where we, you know, offer the same things, diagnostic assessment, medication management, same services. Um, in addition, we spoke uh, earlier about our developmental disability services. We have three ch training centers. And in our training centers, we really focus on uh, addressing those deficits that I, I spoke to you about earlier, basic skill training, mm -hmm. trying to uh, teach people to complete tasks out in the community so that they can function optimally in the community. Well, that is one of the things we saw with the Developmentally uh, Disabled Program mm -hmm. was the uh, Special Olympics yes, uh, mm -hmm. trip to the Special Olympics that yes. some of the um, 
clients took, and right. that was uh, it was remarkable to see them. And it, it you see the improvement how they come out the mm -hmm. more they experience the world. Absolutely, they love it. You know, the families love it. They, you know, they do their best, and we've done pretty well. I think the past couple of years, mm -hmm. of taking yeah. home a couple Co of medals. Couple so, of medals, yes. So we're happy about that. Our, our, our staff give of their time, and, and and they participate as well. So that's something that we're really proud of. Great. Well, what let's say a, a person presents at a clinic. And you say you do the diagnosis first, and mm -hmm. the person, all he or she knows is that I'm, you know, in malaise. I, I don't feel like getting out of bed, right. and so, so where does it go from there? Right. Once, well, you'll come in, and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll, we'll, you'll let us know that you're in, in need of some sort of need, and so we sit down, we spend time with that person, we we ask uh, based on our training. There are certain questions that we ask about, you know, different aspects of that person's life. Uh, not just the symptoms that they're having, but also uh, heavy emphasis on what impact are these symptoms having. We, uh, we, we ask about your family life, your, your uh, occupational history, past mm -hmm. and present, your history of any psychiatric uh, treatment or conditions, your medical history, because um, again, uh, your, your mental health is connected with your physical health. Um, it's important to know that some physical illnesses their first sign uh, mm -hmm. is a mental health illness. Uh, there are some people who, with cancer who uh, you diagnose that based on them saying, I'm depressed. They come in for an evaluation, you do a medical workup, next thing you know you find out they've had a certain kind of cancer. So it's a comprehensive assessment that needs to happen. And, and it's important to uh, diagnose accurately because treatments vary depending on the diagnosis. Uh, what I may prescribe for someone uh, who has schizophrenia may be different than when I prescribe for someone who has anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to, to have an accurate diagnosis. It guides uh, all of the treatment recommendations, not medication only. How successful are the treatments for adults? Uh, I would say that the, the level of success varies. Uh, we have to define what success is. Uh, generally speaking, I would say the treatments have come a long way and they're very successful. We can get people back to a point where they're functioning in the community as opposed to, you know, imagine what it's like to go from working one day to being in an inpatient hospital mm -hmm. uh, where you can't leave. Uh, we want to get people, if you're in a hospital, you're not interacting with your family, you're not working, you're not in school, you're not functioning. So uh, I think our treatments are very effective at get people, getting people back to work, back to school, and even if they're not back to 100%, which we can do, but there are times when maybe that person's not back to 100%, but at least they're out and they're functioning, they're contributing. That, that is wonderful. Uh, and that brings us to the services for children. What uh, kinds of services are available for kids who need behavioral health so treatment? Some, some of those same services. In addition, we, we have partnerships with the schools. You know, we'll do uh, groups in schools. Uh, we have relationships with school counselors and school psychologists. They may refer people to us and we provide assessment, diagnosis, and, and, and we'll come up with a treatment plan. We work with families to connect them to resources. Uh, imagine you have a family, a parent who's homeless, and now they have uh, two or three children with them, uh, and they're in need of, of services. We have staff members who go out to the community and work towards connecting them to these different services. Uh, we work with some of the um, daycare centers, shel mm -hmm. sheltering arms in particular, uh, we, we provide consultation to them, and, and so there are a number of things in our CNA program that we do. And is that what happens at the new beautiful, renovated, the wonderful lovely, Oak Hill wonderful campus. Oak Hill? I Absolutely. mean, I just can't say, I can't sing its praises Absolutely. enough. Just a beautiful place. Absolutely. Tell us about that. It's a wonderful place. Uh, we have uh, a number of programs there. You mentioned some uh, at the beginning. We have housing there. We provide dental services there. Uh, we have uh, we have room for some primary care pediatrics uh, to be involved there. Um, you know, uh, we focus a lot on partnerships, bringing people in, and and seeing what we can do together to serve the children. Uh, in the area. So it's a wonderful place and we're continuing to grow. Had the opportunity recently to uh, uh, watch the little ones plant their first community garden. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When kids come in uh, or they have to be brought to you by an adult I would take it because mm -hmm. they may not necessarily know what's going on with them. What signals is it that parents or guardians should look for when kids seem to be troubled? Commonly, commonly it's behavior. 
You know, a child is not going to come to you and say, Mom and Dad, I'm depressed, or Mom and Dad, I'm having a panic attack. You'll see changes in their behavior, whether it's at home or at school. Sometimes it's specific to the environment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see it uh, across environments. And so once you see this behavior and it's not responding uh, to your basic parental interventions, that's the time to, to, to ask, to reach out and, and see what help is available. So really look at that child, their behavior, know your child, know when they're uh, acting a bit different, they're withdrawn or they're a bit more aggressive or they're crying more. These are signs that something may not be right. And uh, for older kids, uh, well, actually, Oak Hill, the Oak Hill Child Adolescent and Family Center is for children from uh, infancy to 21. Yeah, right. And but there's an also a special place for teens who can often find difficulty uh, having behavior issues. Uh, we have a particular program, our clubhouse program, and that's uh, really for uh, adolescents who are at, at risk uh, for substance use. Um, we found that they may be in, engaging in some, some high-risk behaviors. Maybe there's already some substance use that's in place. So we want to uh, work with them and intervene early to prevent uh, some major addiction from developing and causing increasing problems in their lives. So that's a wonderful program. Uh, we have a particular facility uh, that was renovated by our wonderful uh, facilities uh, staff <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and, clubhouse for right, youth. Our clubhouse mm -hmm. for youth. And, and um, it, it, it's a great program. It's going, going quite well. Great. Okay. We'll be back uh, in a moment uh, with Dr. Sims and more on behavioral health and developmental disabilities. And welcome back to Common Ground. I'm Lynn Vaughn, your host with Dr. Sultan Sims, Medical Director of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Services in our Fulton County Health Services Division. Uh, Dr. Sims, we were talking about uh, teenagers who have services at the uh, Clubhouse for Youth. Yes. What, how do we know when teens are being teenagers or when they are troubled and need our help? Well, it's difficult. That's uh, probably an age-old question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, really, it really takes a, lot, a, a keen eye from a parent. It takes a lot of involvement. Uh, be aware, be present, be involved in your child's life because that's really the only way you're going to be able to, de to detect when something is going wrong. Uh, the, you know, you, you have to talk to them, ask them how things are going at school, ask them about their relationships. You know, understand they may not always be forthcoming with information, but continue to be involved, continue to ask those questions, and to, like we said earlier, look for changes in behavior. You know, don't expect uh, an adolescent to come to you and say, this is the, the problem and, and this is where I need help. Mm -hmm. You're going to see changes in behavior. Maybe that A student's grades are now slipping and all of a sudden they're bringing home C's. Uh, maybe that child who or adolescent who is very outgoing and very social, all of a sudden they're home in their room all of the time and it seems like they're crying and maybe the way they're dressing uh, you know is starting to change from a very uh, colorful uh, bright uh, style of dress to a very gray and dark and gloomy style of dressing uh, those things aren't always an obvious sign but those are you know windows into you know what may be going on mm -hmm. uh, what can we do to stop some of the internet uh, troubles that we see kids having these days, uh, the bullying, mm -hmm. the cyber stalking, the, mm -hmm. how do parents intervene in that um, and respect the privacy of the child at the same time? Well, it starts with educa education. Uh, if you, you know, remember that it's a privilege that you're giving oh, yes. your adolescent access to these things. Uh, they may think they have a right to a computer or an iPad, but they don't. Uh, as a parent, if they have those things, it's because of you. You're responsible, so you need to take uh, responsibility for that. Uh, you need to explain to them that these are the rules. Uh, this kind of behavior and these kind of communications are acceptable, and these kind of communications are not. 
and let them know that you will be monitoring their activity. You know, that's not an invasion of privacy. You need to let them know up front that I need to monitor what's going on with you because people are going to hold me responsible as your parent. And, and let them know what the consequences can be. There have been some high-profiled uh, cases. Uh, there was one very recently uh, where a young lady uh, ended up committing suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, she attributed it to being bullied at school. And uh, allegedly one of the young people made a mean comment even after the person uh, died. Mm -hmm. So that's the time to sit down with your adolescent and say, okay, this is what can happen. You are not going to do this. And, right. And, 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 and so you, it's really about education and involvement. I like the part about consequences and also privilege. Absolutely. Uh, it can be given and it can be can taken away. It can be taken away. away. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, back to... Um, the, our programs for the developmentally disabled. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges facing those clients? Uh, well, many of these clients are unable to care for themselves mm -hmm. on their own. Um, now, there's a wide range in, in level of functioning. Uh, there are some who have kind of a mild impairment and with their proper amount of support can, you know, have a job. Uh, maybe in some cases uh, live independently, although that's not really the case with those that we serve. Um, but then there are some who are total care. They need help uh, with basic tasks, basic grooming, um, ba personal hygiene. Um, so uh, without the services that we offer, uh, life would be very difficult for them and very difficult for parents and family members. Um, you know, without uh, being able to come to our training centers, these families wouldn't be able to work. Uh, or, or go to school or, or contribute in other positive ways that they are contributing to our community. So, um, And our training centers are located north, central, and, and south. south. And um, we, what takes place there? Are they, are the clients dropped off by the parents? Do we pick them up? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about it. I'll say in most cases we have a bus service that will go out to the homes and pick pick clients up. There are some uh, families who choose to drop uh, their family member off and pick them up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both um, uh, modes of, of transportation happen. Uh, we have instructors and skills trainers who are there working with the clients all day in a very close kind of small group setting. Uh, and we tailor our interventions uh, based on the needs of that client. So it's not that everyone is just in one big group doing the exact same thing. We sit down, there are a team of professionals involved in doing the assessment, uh, figuring out uh, what goals need to be set uh, and, and what needs to happen moving forward to help this person function optimally. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we work on improving those skills that we've identified as, as uh, needing improvement. Well, we not only uh, followed our uh, clients as they were practicing bocce ball, but we also had the opportunity to uh, see them on a trip to the Capitol, mm -hmm. where Governor Deal celebrated, I believe it was the 15th annual Disability Day mm -hmm. at the Capitol. And Absolutely. so to have the clients out there uh, with other people, caregivers, everybody, thousands and thousands of people, mm -hmm. uh, I think it, you're right, it's important to have them out and functioning and exercising the skills that they can. Absolutely, and it helps with awareness. You know, mm -hmm. we, we are our own best advocates. You know, we need our clients to not be in the shadows. Mm -hmm. They need to be out so people yes. can see them and see yes. what they're doing. Uh, they're and, part of us. And they bring value to our community. And, you know, uh, you know budgets are tight. Uh, funding has to come from somewhere, so we need people to kind of get up and stand up and say, look, uh, we have needs, um, we're here, we're present, and, and, and to ask and advocate uh, for services to be provided. And finally, I uh, understand that we also do work with the jail mm -hmm. and the court system uh, to treat incarcerated persons who are suffering from uh, mental or behavioral disorders. Is yes, that right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What we really want to do is intervene. Uh, these are people who maybe because of their uh, mental illness um, are committing crimes and are ending up uh, having contact with the justice system. So what we do, once they get in, we have a team of uh, really case managers. Uh, they'll assign uh, cases to our case managers. We'll kind of monitor them while they're in jail. And once they get out, we make sure they're connected to treatment, 
uh, make sure they have stable housing, and to the extent that we can, we help them get access to other resources in the community, whether it's job opportunities or ability to get a GED or uh, applications for Social Security and any other benefits that, that are available. Um, those are the things that we focus on. And with the long-term vision and hope being that uh, when you give people the support they need and the mm -hmm. services they need, maybe they'll be less likely to commit crimes and end up back in that revolving door that can be our criminal justice system. Well, that's a, a big woohoo for that. Let's hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much for mm -hmm. being with us. Thank this has been delightful, me. and we're going to have to do this again. Absolutely. My pleasure. Anytime. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. As Dr. Sims has pointed out, there is absolutely no shame in seeking mental health treatment for yourself, your children, or friends or family members. To take advantage of the services offered by Fulton County, we'd like for you to visit or call one of these centers, the South Fulton or the West Fulton Behavioral Health Centers, the Adamsville Regional Health Center, the Center for Health and Rehabilitation, our Neighborhood Union Health Center, and the North Fulton Service Center Health Center in Sandy Springs. Now, assistance for children is available at the Oak Hill Child, Adolescent, and Family Center and the Clubhouse for Youth. The best number to call to reach all of the behavioral health and the developmental disability centers is 404-613-3675. The web address is livebetterfulton.org. I'm Lynn Vaughn. We'll see you next time right here on Common Ground.